there was the Jewish factor. He did not have the web of connections that all the other politicians had, and that, of course, was a great disadvantage. So it was a struggle for him. Disraeli had a clear problem. He just couldn't get a parliamentary seat. And he realised, finally, that to succeed, he would need to find a powerful backer. And he found one. His name was Lord Lyndhurst, a prominent member of Sir Robert Peel's Conservative government. That government, by the way, also included William Gladstone. Well, Lyndhurst and Disraeli had something of a special bond because they'd both been having an affair with the same woman. And Lyndhurst decided to give Disraeli's political career a bit of a kickstart by holding a grand dinner in his honour on the 17th of January, 1835. And it turned out to be quite an event. The dinner party was held with the aim of introducing Disraeli to well-known movers and shakers on the political scene. And it performed this function very well. It's one of the reasons we remember it today. Much more important, though, is the fact that this is the first occasion on which he and Gladstone are known to have met. And right from the start, significantly, they did not hit it off. It's interesting that this really was uh, an immediate dislike. Disraeli uh, said uh, after the dinner party that uh, the company there had been dull. Uh, the best uh, company uh, had in fact been the swan stuffed with truffles. Gladstone's judgment in many ways was even more damning. When he goes home that night, uh, he actually writes in his diary that he'd been to this dinner, but Disraeli actually doesn't even merit a mention. The mutual indifference that revealed itself that night would in time mature into hatred. But before it did, both men reached an important milestone in their personal lives. Within a few years of each other, they both got married. Each linked up with a woman to whom he'd remain wed until separated by death. Gladstone's wedding came first, and it surprised many of his friends, who despaired of him ever finding a partner. Gladstone uh, famously struggled to get married. One of his uh, early uh, uh, attempts uh, was so appalled uh, when she saw him stomping towards the house that she said, uh, Mama, I simply can't marry a man who carries his bag like that. Finally, he meets a woman called Catherine Glynn, who uh, in many ways is mad as a hatter but who provides the stability Gladstone needs. She'd failed in her own recent marital arrangements, and so she was in danger of uh, being um, left on the shelf. And that was the biggest motive that she had in the end for agreeing to him. People were, at the time said, you know, it's going to be a, an interesting relationship. But it worked well in the end. Disraeli's marriage to a wealthy heiress called Mary Ann Lewis also aroused doubts among those who knew the bride and groom well. But it proved to be a very good match. Disraeli married for money, but he very quickly uh, realised that, in fact, uh, he would have married Mary Ann for love. There's one famous occasion uh, when uh, Disraeli returns late from a, uh, a debate in the House of Commons uh, to find Mary Ann sitting up waiting for him. It's about three o'clock in the morning. There she is with a Fortnum and Mason pork pie uh, and a bottle of champagne, and Disraeli uh, exclaims, My dear, you're more like a mistress than a wife. It was a terrific marriage. Um, they were very, very close. It was generally thought that he was faithful to her, and I think he probably was. That didn't stop him, you know, thinking other women were beautiful, flirting with them, etc. But he, they were really a partnership. For more than 30 years, Mr and Mrs Disraeli, or Lord and Lady Beaconsfield, as they eventually became, lived together in great happiness in the splendid surroundings of Hewenden Manor in Buckinghamshire. The house symbolises Disraeli's desire to be seen as an honorary member of the British aristocracy, a group of people whose way of life he admired and whose approval he sought throughout his life. 
When Disraeli and his wife moved into this magnificent new home in 1848, his career had already taken off. He was thought of as a future Conservative Prime Minister. And what a difference to his prospects nine years earlier when they got married. Because at that time, his chances of reaching the top were very remote. Disraeli's career in the House of Commons got off to a truly terrible start in December 1837, when he made his famously dreadful parliamentary debut. His maiden speech was an absolute disaster. He didn't catch the mood of the House of Commons, the tone of it at all. He delivered a sort of terrifically theatrical oration, and people booed and jeered. Most young politicians are arrogant, but few could have gone quite so over the top when making the maiden speech. He, he, it was elaborate in manner, apparently, grand eloquent, laying about him as if he was an elder statesman on the moment of his arrival. And people fell about laughing. He wasn't just booed or disagreed with. People thought the whole thing was hilarious. He realised eventually that this disaster was growing worse, and he, he wound up with the famous uh, phrase, uh, I shall sit down now, but you will listen to me hereafter. This is very much a, a humiliation, a real setback for Disraeli, but he does learn an important lesson from it. His speeches in the House of Commons from this period on are much quieter, more reserved. He also starts to dress in a more sober kind of way he realises that if he's going to be taken seriously as a politician, uh, he needs to look the part. Disraeli's recovery was incredibly swift. Within a couple of years, he'd established himself as one of the real rising stars of Robert Peel's Conservatives. And when Peel took office for a second time as Prime Minister in 1841, Disraeli just waited for that offer of a government job to come through. The offer never came and Disraeli took it very personally, so personally that his mind turned to revenge. What Disraeli decided to do was to place himself at the head of a famous backbench revolt. It revolved around Sir Robert Peel's determination to do away with the Corn Laws, the well-established rules which artificially boosted the price of foreign wheat. The whole point of the Corn Laws was to protect the British farmer and landowner, many of whom, of course, were Tory MPs, because by putting a tax on imported wheat or corn, this homegrown product became much more competitive, and that was the trick. But for Peel, this was, frankly, a denial of the principles of free trade, and he decided that the Corn Laws would simply have to go. Peel knew that many of his own backbenchers would bitterly oppose his plan because, of course, it threatened to reduce their incomes. He thought he could push it through anyway because he had the support of most of his government colleagues, including Gladstone. His calculation could have proved correct, but it didn't, thanks largely to Disraeli. The fact is that Disraeli wasn't that exercised about the Corn Laws. He almost certainly thought that getting rid of them was a good idea. He was far more exercised about making trouble for Peel. He wanted to punish him. He saw the chance to lead a revolt, and that's exactly what he did. But he could never have foreseen the results, because party politics was thrown into chaos for the next 20 years. The sheer ferocity of Disraeli's assault on Peel took everyone by surprise. He subjected the Prime Minister's policy to a series of brilliantly argued attacks in the Commons. They had a devastating effect. There was not an articulate spokesman in the Commons who could take on the great politician of the day, the founder of the Conservative Party, in my opinion, Robert Peel, apart from Disraeli, who brutally and brilliantly took on the finest politician of his age and completely destroyed him. In the end, Peel did get his way over the Corn Laws, but Disraeli's campaign against him had weakened his authority so much that he resigned as Prime Minister and as leader of the Tory party. 
Peel's resignation caused a bit of an earthquake because he didn't just resign as Conservative leader, he left the party altogether and he took most of the front bench with him, including William Gladstone. And they formed a new group, they were known as the Peelites. And it all left the Tories in a bit of a mess. No leader, no sense of direction. And the big question, what would it all mean for Benjamin Disraeli? On the face of it, Disraeli's prospects didn't look that good. After all, he'd attacked the leader of his own party, the Prime Minister, and Tories have consistently taken a dim view of that kind of thing. Margaret Thatcher, let's face it, will history will regard as a giantess of a politician. Heseltine, a formidable politician, brought her down. And the reason Michael Heseltine never became Prime Minister was that the assassin could not take over the crown. The one person they would not vote for, even the ones who'd voted to remove Margaret, was Michael, because he played too great a part in her downfall. Now, uh, you can argue about what Michael's role really was in Margaret's downfall. She brought her own downfall about, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, what he, any role he played was minute compared with Disraeli's public destruction of the political reputation and debating skills of Sir Robert Peel. But Disraeli had an advantage which later Tory rebels haven't had. His party badly needed a set of skills which only he possessed. All of the really good talent, including Gladstone, left with Robert Peel. So the Conservative Party that's left, uh, other than Disraeli, is very much the backwoodsman. Uh, they're not particularly bright, they're not good orators. Now, this puts the new leader of the Conservative Party, the Earl of Derby, in a very tricky position. He doesn't like Disraeli, finds him something of an upstart, but he recognises that he's the only Conservative MP of any merit at all. He may have been a complete misfit, surrounded by the aristocracy and landed gentry, but he was twice as bright as any of them, and they all realised he was the only man that could possibly lead their cause. Toppling Peel brought Disraeli huge rewards. He became the Conservative leader in the House of Commons, and he had every reason to be pleased with himself. But the events leading up to his great advance had wounded him too. They had earned him the lasting hatred of many influential people, most notably William Gladstone. When Disraeli destroyed Peel, Gladstone was shocked went with Peel and became a Peelite, hating Disraeli ever thereafter for that alone, I think. At one point, the Conservatives tried to win Gladstone back. They were always trying to get Gladstone to come back and trying to get the Peelites to come back. Gladstone wouldn't come back because he hated Disraeli. In time, Gladstone's feelings about Disraeli would surface explosively. But before they'd had a chance to do so, the future Liberal leader made the first in a long series of withdrawals from frontline politics. Despite becoming the Member of Parliament for his beloved city of Oxford in 1847, he didn't spend much time over the next few years in the House of Commons. He remained instead within the walls of Harden Castle the country house in Flintshire, which had become his family home after his marriage to Catherine Glynn. Unlike Hewenden Manor, Disraeli's home, this house is still occupied today by descendants of the great man who once owned it, and parts of it have hardly changed since Gladstone's day, a fact I discovered when his great-grandson showed me around. When he came to live at Harden, his bachelor a uh, bro uh, brother-in-law was still in residence, was the squire of the place, and um, W.E.G. and his large family came into residence, and he said, the one thing I've got to have is my own library. So he built this on, and, of course, he lived and worked in here whenever he was out of office for years and years. And did he call it his library? What he, did he called call it? it his Temple of Peace. Temple it of became peace. the Temple of Peace, and that's what it uh, still is today. It seems perfectly preserved. It, it feels very Victorian and it smells quite Victorian too. Well, it is, uh, yes, it is a unique political shrine. 
Lots of, look at this, lots of interesting things, this image. Yes, um, well, he was a great family man. He's there with his seven 